Hello, my name is Mark Lynn. I am at Beaumont Farmington Hills. Today we'll be following a radiologist and to see what their life is like. So my name is Rocky Sines. I'm a radiologist here at Beaumont Farmington Hills. It used to be Botsford. You might have heard that name, so I'll throw that out. Um, a little bit about me. I'm from Texas originally. Did medical school. Did all my training in Texas until the match. Matched here at the time was Botsford and was a resident here in the 2000s. Then I graduated, did a fellowship at MRI. So my typical day, it depends because we do rotations, but one thing that's constant for me is uh, for most of the rotations is I'm here about 8 a.m. Most days is my start time. And then I finish usually about four o'clock. Um, sure, you can be busy and sometimes finish at five or a little after five, but I'd say 80% of the time we're done by four, 4.15. Today I'm doing MRI. We do different rotations as our residents do as well. We do weekly rotations, so I'm doing MRI today. So for the most part, I'm reading MRI, but we also dabble and do other things. So I will be reading a little bit of pets today. I'll be reading some x-ray probably this afternoon, and also CT. Um, as far as me, we read like, I'd say an average day in eight hours. Most radiologists are going to read about 80 to 100 cases. And when I say that, you know, it just depends on the modality, but it's a mix. If you're reading x-ray, it could all be 100 x-rays. If you're reading, you know, CT, it might only be 40 CTs and, you know, 20 x-rays. MRI, maybe 40 MRIs and, you know, 10 other things. So point being is this, is um, case mix is different and you're reading all these cases. Your role, you help all other physicians. So the majority of our physician, physician, so I like to say we're consultants to physicians. So what I mean is, whether they call me and have a question, you know, here's a blank clinical situation, what should I do? Should I do an MRI or should I do a CT? Do I do a CT with contrast, without contrast? IV, oral, what? So we, that's first off, is we help them to decide what to do. Is it appropriate to do imaging or not? Secondarily is um, consultation for uh, what to do with a case. Example, like I said earlier, you have an appendicitis with an abscess, right? So my first role is I call the surgeon or your doctor and say, hey, we have this. Then the surgeon's going to say, is that something you can drain? And I'd say, sure, yeah, I can get to that. I can drain it if you'd like to. Um, they might say, well, you know, if you can't drain it, then I'm going to take it to surgery. But if you can drain it and, and, and put a catheter in it or just drain the fluid out, then I'd like to sit on the patient and maybe not take them to surgery. So one is, is being a consultant in that way, helping manage the patient. For example, I might read an MRI of a knee to, to a, for a family practice person, and it says meniscal tear, first impression, only impression. They call me and say, uh, I understand there's a meniscal tear, but what do we need to do with that? Because I'm not going to put in my impression uh, cons consult recommended for you know surgical consultation or orthopedic surgery. If they don't know that and they're a novice attending or it's some type of pathology they don't know about, they will call me and say, does this need referral to, to ortho? And I say, yeah, you need to send this to ortho, it's surgical. You know, um, I have those conversations a lot of times with vertebral fractures. Patients, outpatient can get a spinous process fracture, right, or transverse process fracture. They'll call me and say, does this need to go to spine surgery? The answer is no, they can treat that conservatively, they're fine, don't worry about it, it's okay. On average, it just depends on our service. If I'm working ER, I'm talking to, we have an actual ER rotation. If I'm working here, I'm talking to attendings once or twice an hour, sometimes even more. Um, if I'm on an outpatient service like MRI, I probably only talk to four or five attendings during the day. So it all depends upon what you're doing. So one thing about radiology I'd like everybody to know and be clear about is that um, one is you can do as much or as little patient care as you'd like. I do have friends that literally never see patients or talk to them, but that's a minority of radiologists. I'd say like 20%. Most of us see patients, um, whether you see them daily um, or every other day is up to where your schedule is set. But most, most radiologists, like 25% of the time you're with the patient and 75% of the time you're at a monitor like you see here at the PAC station. Um, whereas there's the other side of it, whereas I have also friends that are radiologists uh, that have done IR fellowships and not done IR fellowships, but that do nothing but procedures all day. So, you know, and where they're doing 80% of the time they're doing procedures, 20% of the time they're monitor dictating their procedure or maybe dictating x-rays or CTs to help out their practice. So a different assignment. So the cool thing about it, I think, uh, that's very unique is you can do as much as you want or as little as you want of patient care, direct patient care. Yes, we're looking at most of the time, as you see here, a representative image of the patient, but I'm talking about directly talking to the patient, seeing them, doing a procedure, interacting with them. So that's a very, very unique part of it. So for me personally, I, I went to medical school, and I'm a DO, so I went to DO school. I was primary care up until I did rotations, and uh, one of my first rotations was radiology. And as they like to say, you know, in radiology, I saw the dark, or I was in the dark and found my place, not I saw the light, because you're in the dark. So anyway, and for me it was, you know, x-rays and CTs, I thought they were really cool. I knew what they were in medical school, but I really liked them. And then... Once I was following the resident around and I saw a resident doing actually GI procedures and I saw like a lot of fluoroscopy, I thought that 
radiologists never talk to patients. And I saw him going and talking to a patient five or 10 minutes and doing a procedure, solving a question, uh, you know, for the, for the diagnosis or making a diagnosis and solving a problem. And um, then I thought, well, that's really cool. Then a lot, for me at least, the uh, cherry on top was, I happened to be like in my maybe second week, it was a month rotation or third week. And literally I was hanging out with one resident. So long short of it was, I got into an angiogram with them and it was like a 90 year old lady who had a GI bleed and was dying. And I helped him, literally, it was a medical student holding the wires and holding pressure and little things I could do. But he was able to get the catheter in the right place, embolize that patient, and save her life. And I was like, wow, radiology saved someone's life? I didn't know you could do that. So anyway, so that was like, then I knew all the different things you could do. And it was just kind of funny, because then when I got into residency, from that point on, as most students are, right, I wanted to be an IR person. And I was like, going to save the world and do IR and save everybody. And then something over time happened to me about halfway through residency, I fell in love with MR, which is what I did for my fellowship. So that's my story. Um, so other things, so back to our procedures. So we do not only, you know, chest procedures, GI procedures, you know, literally radiologists biopsy every organ in the body, minus brain and spine. So what I mean is you can biopsy a lung, you can biopsy someone's arm or finger, like a muscle or a bone, and you do a little bit of everything. Um, drainage catheters and but so the point being is we literally do all parts of the body so our procedures are very variable it's not the same thing over and over again so ai right artificial intelligence when i was a resident all right in the early 2000s so i finished my training in 2006 but when i was a resident we had ai then in the very beginning people were telling me that when i was finishing medical school why are you going to do that you know, when you're going to do your job and i can tell you now um, being that I go to, actually I went to RSNA this year, it's virtual, but RSNA is the biggest uh, meeting if you've never heard of radiology, about 60,000 people. Point is, is all the vendors are there and they show you all the latest AI. All the AI doing now is they're helping us. And what I mean is, even when I first was a resident in radiology, we would have our, uh, it was an AI for mammograms and they still use that, every place uses it. Literally, the machine puts circles on the image for you. These are areas you should look at. They're suspicious to the computer. In the case of mammogram, looking for calcifications and DCIS. So anyway, um, it's always been a help to us. So right now, it's kind of like an adjunct. It kind of it like helps us at the monitor or at the pack station. So it's making you do your job more efficiently, right, and also faster. So it's really been a great thing for us. So it's not really going to ever replace us. One of the other misconceptions is what's going to stop, say, radiologists in India or Mexico or Australia or Canada for meeting your studies, you know, uh, and, and billing for it cheaper because they live in, you know, a third world country and, it, and you know, they can pay them $5 a case and to them that's a lot of money. ACR passed a law or got it passed through legislation. So there's a national law that says to read any case in America, you actually have to be a board certified radiologist in America. So what I was going to say in private practice, Radiology practices run two different ways. The majority, about 75 to 80 percent, run like you're going to see today. What I mean is, where radiologists are doing all kinds of things. Like I'm, later on, as I finish these PETs, I'm sorry, as I finish these MRIs, I'm going to read X-rays, I'm going to read PETs, I'm going to read all kinds of things. So you do a little bit of everything. In the academic institutions, you'd only do one thing all day, and that's it. So, example, you read an MRE, you would read 30 MREs, and that's all you did. So I like variety. That's why I'm in private practice. So that's one big difference. Uh, how is your like on-call schedule? I know radiologists has a unique system called Nighthawk. Exactly. Call yeah. quickly? So some practices like my own, uh, we do our own call. So in some practices do what's called Nighthawk. And Nighthawk is a generic term. It means a radiologist works overnight. So typically it's going to be, say, midnight or 10 p.m. till 6 or 8 in the morning. And that's a shift that they do typically off-site. It could be on-site, too, depending if they actually employ the Nighthawk person. A lot of times it could be a national company that a lot of because a lot of small practices use, and um, literally that's all they do. So in other words, whenever time you want as a private practice, your night hawk to take over, 8 p.m., 10 p.m., 12 midnight, whatever. Um, no one's calling you or bothering you anymore. Night hawk just going to do that, but you would never be bothered if you don't want to. The other flip side of it is, and this is again going back to the to the flexibility of making radiology what you want it to be, which is what I really like, is you can work for a group privately as their overnight radiologist, or you could work for a company as a Nighthawk radiologist. And I'll give you an example. So one of our recent graduates, um, and she had three kids, and she wanted to have a fourth kid. So what she decided to do with her local area uh, where she got her job was be their Nighthawk. And literally, she worked every night at home um, with her kids. 
So there's not many jobs you can do where you're holding a baby, breastfeeding a baby, or bouncing a baby, you know, on your lap or knee to put them to sleep or whatever to console them and do your job at the same time and see patients. We can do it because that's all we see of these patients if that's, if that's what you want. So um, that's generally the concept of Nighthawk. I'll give you another example. I have a friend that lives in Florida. He lives on the beach in Florida so because he does what's called, we generally call second shift. Say noon to eight or maybe two to 10, right? That's that second shift. Then the Nighthawk takes over after that. So a friend of mine does all second shift because they allow you to do that from home as they usually do with Nighthawk. And he does that from his little bungalow he's got on the beach and he never goes into the hospital because that's what he wants to do. So it's just kind of cool is he's out there with his laptop. He sent me pictures he used to back when he was first doing it because it was kind of groundbreaking 10 years ago, not anymore. Pretty commonplace. And that's what he does. And he, he loves it. Just to give you a little bit of uh, history, this is a 78 year old female that we're seeing for possible carcinoma. So this is an MRI without or with contrast. So this, here's the mass and it's wrapped here with a sigmoid colon. And then here's the mass again. So you can have measured it there, but here's the normal sigmoid colon. That's fluid, which is kind of harder to see because it's a T2, uh, but on normal fat, because on T2 fat is bright. And so it's fluid, but food slightly brighter is how it looks different. So I can see the mass projecting off right there. So then I'm going to show you the way it looks like on contrast. We really looked at the, at the fat side image. Here's the post contrast image. So in this image, you can see, um, of course, a bowel's going to enhance because it's a living thing. But here you can see this kind of block-like enhancement, and that's our lesion there, which on the straight T1 is really, really hard to see. So that's kind of, we use them all to complement each other. Now to make, so unfortunate for this patient to make things even worse as we come down into her pelvis. Um, so here's normal, right? So sigmoid going to rectum. So this is normal rectum here. Okay, so what's not normal, let me take it off this mode. What's not normal is you can see, here's another implant, there's another mask here. Um, this is all normal fat. This shouldn't be here. There's little nodules here. This is now fluid in her cul-de-sac. And here's all these other nodules. And then here's a uterus and there's all these nodules around it. So all of these areas are all going to be uh, metastatic disease. So the only history they gave me was rule out tumor, potentially a GU tumor. So I would assume that the gynecologist knows something I don't. So maybe there was an abnormal uh, pap smear. This is what I showed before the enlarged endometrium. There's a fluid fluid level, which you should never see, especially in someone that doesn't menstruate. So what this is basically is like vaginal and uh, uterine uh, mucosa or like mucus inside that's just been sitting there because it can't get out because of all these tumors. So it's kind of getting a fluid fluid level. So it's, it's probably even starting to become infected. That's the debris, it's a debris level. And then here it's just all covering the uterus. I would assume this is probably a cervical cancer growing out and around right here that we're seeing. Could be a, a lyomyosarcoma. So um, basically, a, you know, a fibroid that's that's become sarcomatous, which could be this growing on the sides. Um, I doubt that this is going to be a sigmoid cancer that grew here and then went down. It's possible, but that's also in the differential. So I don't know. And uh, maybe they, like I said, they probably know because maybe they did the pap smear and have that answer. Uh, so if it's not related to that, it's not a squamous cell carcinoma there, then maybe it's endometrial carcinoma. If it's not that, then it would have to be a GI carcinoma here because that's where this big implant is. So I don't know, um, but that's pretty much this case. I'm going to dictate it now or finish dictating it. Okay, so I'm Matt Waldrop. I'm a PGY3 uh, diagnostic radiology resident at Beaumont Farmington Hills in Michigan. So what's like your typical day uh, as, a, as a resident? Typical day. Um, we get in. During our first year, we do a lot of morning conference. Second year, it's a little more variable on whether or not we do a morning conference. But typically, we, day starts at 8 a.m. and you figure out who you're going to be working with that day, meaning which attending you'll be working with, um, what service you'll be working with, which is usually set for the month. Um, so you can figure out you know, the attending schedule changes weekly, but it's good to know who you'll be signing out with to figure out, okay, uh, what time do they, does the attending want to do sign outs? You know, what's my schedule for the day like? You build up as a first year, trying to figure out kind of every little detail of every image, make sure you know it down pat, and then kind of go faster from there and then build up the complexity of cases that you can do. Um, and then it's pretty much the same as the eight to noon as um, from one to four. You, um, pick up your studies, sign out with your attending, um, do as many as you know you're capable and feel confident in doing, and um, you know try to learn something new every day. 
Okay, so in terms of procedures, at what timeline um, do you start doing procedures and how, how often is it implemented along those lines? We start doing them like GI procedures. We teach our first year residents how to do them very early on so they can uh, help, help out do the GI studies. IR, you start doing the procedures once you, you know, start the service and get shown how to do them. And once, you, once the attending feels comfortable with you doing them, you start doing them, uh, you know, as soon as you're comfortable. In terms of research, is that very integrated in your program or how involved are you in research? Research is something that's available to all who seek it out. You know, we do have to present uh, our own published research at a conference that's part of our um, program that's like a requirement for graduation. Right now, typically, um, I've just done like case report type type of things um, through RSNA and different uh, other journals. Um, like one we're doing is with the American Journal of Neuroradiology, so that's kind of cool, a case of the month. Is the, is the progress of the work mostly independent at your own pace or is there like a set fast pace that you have to follow the curriculum? How does that work for this program in particular? So based on the rotation you're on, there is a syllabus with, you know, suggested readings and, you know, a template for you to, to get yourself ready for the rotation and then the readings that you do on the rotation. Anytime you're encountering something new, which once you start out, radiology is totally brand new, you're going to have a decent learning curve. How everyone adapts to that learning curve is, is totally on their own. Is there any advice that you want to give them or any knowledge that you, that you want to give? I would just recommend trying to find a radiologist, usually, or, or a radiology resident. Um, most are very, very friendly and uh, would happily take a potential student on to shadow them and hang out for a while. And, Um, Sophia Martinez, I'm uh, the chief resident this year, one of the PGY5, um, also known as R4 residents. Um, that distinction is because as a radiology uh, residency, it's five years in total, however, that's split into one year of a general intern uh, year of mainly medicine or surgical based, and then four years dedicated to diagnostic radiology. So we, uh, we like to designate our level as either the PGY5, which is your total postgraduate year, and um, your radiology level, which is a senior support year. Um, I guess getting into some of the in and outs of the day-to-day -day life of radiology. Uh, basically, we come in, uh, the list is yours, you start picking up studies. As you uh, go through the day, you kind of go at your own pace based on your level of training. When you get to senior, my level, you will do a lot higher volume of cases a day trying to challenge yourself to get ready for the attending workload. Uh, so that's pretty much the morning and the afternoon is just doing as many cases as you can, uh, looking things up as you go along the way. We just started doing a physics lecture every day, or sorry, every week at noon, uh, which is the Telerad physics, which um, is excellent. It's because it's already built into our week. It's built into our Wednesday conference. It's given by an expert in radiologic physics. You will sign out studies uh, one to two times a day with your attending that you're on with, and you would meet together to go over your cases and receive feedback um, on your reports. What um, brought you to become a radiologist? I guess it was the kind of the same thing that led me into medicine. I always liked anatomy, um, loved learning about it. Uh, I loved, I was a nerd who liked to memorize all the different body parts, vessels, nerves, muscles, what have you. I loved that since high school. So that was what actually brought me to medicine. And then um, in turn after that, what kind of led me towards radiology with it's, you know, it's one of the most anatomy, anatomy heavy based specialties uh, to where the foundation of knowledge is rooted in knowing your anatomy really, really well. So since you're a senior, you're going to be applying for fellowship soon. Can you describe a little bit of how that process is or how does it so actually, uh, the unique thing about radiology is you apply really early. So I already applied and was accepted last year. Um, you apply during your R3 year, uh, your PGY4 um, year, that would be the class below me. Uh, and then um, it depends on what fellowship you do. Some of them are not match-based. They're just you apply and you interview until you know you find a, a program you like and a program that offers you a spot, and they offer you a spot, and you say yes, and it's done, like a job. Uh, there are some specialties 
uh, musculoskeletal neuroradiology, breast being some examples that are in a match, very similar to residency. Um, so that process works the same way to where you apply and you interview, but then you submit a match list later in the year and then on match day you find out where you matched. So it will depend on the specialty that you go into. So the nice thing, uh, other nice thing about radiology that a lot of medical students probably don't realize is, is you can customize it, you can subspecialize it more to what you like. So let's say, you know, um, you've always been interested in pediatrics, you've always liked working with kids and, and taking care of them, but at the same time you're really attracted to, you know, some of the uh, perks of the radiology field or, you know, you really like looking at imaging or you know you you like uh, the flexibility of radiology you have the opportunity to still do a residency in radiology and then do a fellowship in pediatrics um, let's say you've always been interested in you know the musculoskeletal system in orthopedics but then you figure out you know you're you're not so much into the procedures and you're more you're more into looking at the x-rays and making a diagnosis you know, you can do a fellowship, you can do radiology, but still specialize in musculoskeletal. So it's, it's very customizable to even if you, you know, have something that you've always been interested in, um, you know, before you kind of became alerted to the field of radiology, uh, you still have those options available to you to where you can uh, kind of do both. You can do radiology, but still um, focus in on, on this uh, field that you're interested in. Right now, we're just going to go over a case. This is a case that Dr. Martinez already dictated, so she previewed this case and made a report for me. And this is what we do we go over several cases with the resident. So we're just going to go over one now. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and stay safe out there, okay?